My name is Hans van Trijp uh, from Wageningen University. And I've been the, the work package leader for work package four. And work package four is the experimental investigation. So I realize you've been confronted with quite a bit of information already. And this is certainly not going to be an exception, this work package four, because in the last couple of years, we've conducted over 20 studies. And that's not counting all the pre-studies and the manipulation checks. So it's, uh, I would say, buckle up and um, we go. So work package four is the experimental investigation. And work package four, just to give you a bit of perspective, we've looked at a wide variety of different types of studies. And I'll give you a, an overview of some of the studies, selection of those. But we have studies which all aim at assessing the effect of claims and symbols in their context. We will have econometric analysis. Klaus already alluded to that. So we have household panel data from which we infer purchase patterns of consumers regarding uh, claims and symbols. We have food intake studies where we actually look at how much people consume of a product in response to claims symbols in their context. And we have a variety of point of sale studies where people either make single purchases from an assortment or where they actually do a whole shopping trip in a simulated shopping environment. So in terms of methodology, we have laboratory studies, we have in-store studies, we have real-life setting stories, and we even have studies across a longer period of time. We're looking, of course, at the effect of claims and symbols in their packaging context and those effects on choice, intake and purchase. And I have the pleasure of presenting most of the experimental studies and my colleague, Prof Professor Andrea Grubel-Klein, she will present the in-store studies uh, in the supermarket. So the first line of research uh, I want to discuss, we know that as work package 4.5, is on the econometric analysis. And these econometric analyses have been conducted by the teams of the University of Copenhagen uh, and uh, Schuttelaar and Partners. And they will answer any difficult questions you have about econometrics. But what was the idea? Actually, I think in Klimbo we had a unique situation because we had data from two different countries, the Netherlands and Denmark. And both of those countries have their overall symbols. So we have the Choices logo, which is widely present in the Netherlands. We have the Nordic Keyhole, which is widely present in Denmark. Between those two countries, we look at overlapping product categories. So we do the analysis of the product category, but we selected categories such that they appeared in Denmark and, uh, and the Netherlands. And we have really strong data. Essentially, we have household panel data, which means that in both of those countries, a commercial market research agency, GFK, monitors at the household level exactly what households put in their purchase basket on any particular day of the week across longer periods of time. So we have really strong data on purchase patterns over a longer period of time. And the researchers actually used a very smart design because we have data one year before the introduction of the, of the symbol to three years after introduction. So we actually have a nice window of data to, see, to look at the effects. For choices, we even have continuous data. So we have data from 2005 to 2009, which includes that period of introduction, 2006. And in Denmark, for the Nordic Keyhole, which was introduced in 2009, we have two waves of data, one year before introduction, and three years after introduction. And you can imagine what we were interested in, what has been the effect of the introduction of these symbols on purchase patterns of uh, representative samples of households. Well, there are more questions, but I want to discuss two results with you. The first question that was addressed is, who is the purchasers of these labeled products? So who purchased products with a symbol uh, on it? And is there a particular type of consumers that we can identify? And is that comparable across product categories and countries? And the second key question is, do consumers actually value those logos uh, on, health, uh, on healthier products? So we have national representative samples from the scanner data on uh, their representative in social demographics. So that's how we pro profile consumers. Um, we have data over a longer period of time. We know exactly what people bought, in, uh, put into the shopping basket, where they bought it, what price they paid, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, as well as which store uh, it was. We analyzed a number of product groups which we carefully selected 
on the basis of that they contain sufficient number of products, of share of products with and without symbols, so that we have a fair comparison. Uh, they cover both basic and non-basic food categories, so we don't have it biased to any of the two. And of course, there should be an overlap between those two, uh, two countries. So the aim of the analysis is who purchased labeled product, and that analysis we do on one point in time. So we do in 2009 in the Netherlands, three years after introduction of the Choices uh, logo, and we do in Denmark in 2012, three years after the introduction of the Keyhole label. And then we do uh, our econometric tricks, um, and we ac actually estimate for any particular household the probability that they will purchase a product with a Choices logo. And we predict that probability from background characteristics of those households. Now, of course, there are many factors that can influence that. So these econometric models, they typically uh, control for a number of other variables, in this particular case, um, product type within the category, and also whether a product is organic or purchased in a discount store. And the simple reason for that is that we don't see those logos on organics, so you want to control for that. And we see an underrepresentation of those logos in discount stores, so that's what you also want to single out. Now, don't look at the numbers. In this particular table, you will see different product categories. In this case, it's Denmark. You will see different background variables that describe the probability that people are a purchaser of those uh, labeled products. And if you see across columns, you see the same color pattern, then there is a consistent profile. So the conclusion, as you can see, there is no consistent profile in the different categories. So there is not one type of households which is typically the purchaser of healthy uh, of uh, symbol labeled products. If you look at the columns, at the rows, if you see a consistency in color, that is actually a background characteristics of the household that predicts very well across the categories. Well, you don't see very strong patterns, but the strong pattern that you see in Denmark is that you have kids in the households that reduces the probability that you will one of those uh, symbol product purchases. We did the same analysis for the Netherlands. It's essentially the same story. You don't see a very consistent pattern in the columns, so there is not one prototypical type of households that buy those uh, products. And here you actually see a strong effect of discount that we already talked about. So that confirms that in discount stores these are underrepresented. So our first conclusion, there is not really a simple purchaser profile across countries and, and products. The most consistent effect we find is actually that children in the household reduce the probability that you buy those products. And we also see that consumer preferences for other product characteristics such as organic and discount stores actually uh, might be a barrier for people to pick up those products simply because they're not there. So in terms of policy representation, if we want those symbols to have a stronger presence, we should see whether we can also get them into new product categories and also into different outlets. That was study one. Study two, <clears throat> same data, same type of data, looked at do consumers value healthy food products? <laughs> now that question, to, to answer that question, you have to understand that in this economic analysis, in the econometric analysis, we look at prices that people pay over time and we assume that these markets are in a sort of equilibrium, which means that if people value products, they will pay more for them, and if they buy products which are more expensive, they value the benefits that the product delivers. And we call that hedonic price models. So price is a reflection of the value. Again, we analyze these data before and after the introduction of the symbol, and we can actually analyze um, whether consumers value those. Now, don't look at all the details, just want to look, you to look at these two columns, because that represents, in the Dutch situation, whether the Choices logo was introduced at any particular moment in time, and whether that was valued by consumers. So you see that for most of the product categories, indeed, the Choices logo is valued by consumers. It also means that products with the Choices, consumers are willing to pay more for. This dummy, it's the same Choices logo, but three months after introduction. And you see even a stronger pattern emerging there. And that basically shows that for these labels and logos to become effective in the market, it may take some time. Yeah, so, 
empirically that means if you do a study on the effect of these logos, make sure you have a bit of a longer time span. We see the same but much more scattered effect for the, the, for the Keyhole logo. So you see for some products, if there is a plus, then consumers are actually valuing it. But in other categories, you see that's not the case. So conclusions and policy recommendations. Yes, consumers value the healthiness of products that they consume. So we've also seen that they pay more for healthy products. And additionally, they value the labels because the, price la the prices are there higher as well. And the second important implication is that the full value that consumers place on the symbol might become only evident after some period of time, and hence that sort of data to evaluate the effect should be taken over a longer period of time. So that's two studies on econometrics. So we didn't ask anything from consumers, we just observed what they did. The next two sets of studies are going to be more experimental on purchase and consumption, and we're going to start with consumption studies. And these are studies which are done at Wageningen University, at Covinus University in Budapest, and at the center of Aragon in Spain. So a joint effort between these different countries. And just as a quick reminder, when it comes to symbols, claims, in the context of packaging events, these are our expectations. We assume that consumers use that information to make inferences. So when they see a claim, when they see a symbol, when they see a visual, they start to reason and think this is a healthy product or this is a tasty product, or this is a product with a high satiety value. And yeah, we particularly look at those four. And we assume that if people are confronted with those products, that that can actually answer their health goal. So if they're motivated to make healthful choices, that will bias them towards products that actually convey that message. But on the other hand, it might also be that being confronted to products with claims, symbols, and packaging visual may actually activate your health goal, which would otherwise not activate it. Yeah, so that's two different effects. There's a complex relation between health and indulgence as a trade-off in two different ways. One is that consumers have a tendency to think if it's healthy, it cannot be tasty. That is the healthy is and tasty intuition. There's quite a bit of research there. And the second one is the problem of indulgence. That consumers feel that if they've done good in whatever way or have satisfied their health goal, that all of a sudden they go, bam. They compensate, they feel a license to indulge and a period of restriction actually is uh, followed by a period of unhealthy choices. So that's the effects we're looking at and all the effects we relate back to those mechanisms. This is the first type of study. So in the consumption we look at satiety inferences. And the idea is that if we have a packaging that has the cues that make people to make inferences that this is a product that has high satiating value, then that should actually help consumers to reduce intake. Yeah, in that sense, claims can help reduce consumption. This is a study we, uh, we conducted. So we manipulate different packages. I'll leave it to you to decide which one you think has more satiating value, but you, but you see the idea, I guess. So we vary the packaging color. We have a symbol, in this case a clock or a control, so a clock to trigger that it keeps you full for longer. And we have a satiety claim, no hunger to the next. And we would assume that consumers make inferences about satiating value, how much you would normally consume for that product, and that would hopefully also manifest itself in consumption. We've tried a variety of different designs. So between subjects, within subjects, so everyone sees one, everyone sees all the packages. Uh, we've done it with or without brands, but I must tell you that the story is quite consistent. Because in all our studies, we essentially find that consumers do not make those inferences from the year. So they're very, very subtle. If we do within subjects design, color has a huge impact. But if we do it between subjects design, where you have less of that cognitive inference, um, consumers don't do that. Um, but color of the pack serves as a proxy of uh, heavy versus light if you have a within subjects design. And, and psychological theory can actually explain that. Um, if we look at the relationship between packs and consumption, does that affect actual intake? Then we see no effect when there is no satiety claim, so it's, consumption is not effective. And we see that a dark package can support a satiety claim. I'll show you that here. So here you can see the two studies. This is where we have no claim, and you see that there is no effect of the color of the packaging. If anything, people would eat a bit more of the dark color, which is 
different, different from what we expected. But if you look at the Stygy claim with the dog package, you see actually it reduces the intake to some degree, but again, it's a, it's a very subtle effect. It's not a very strong effect. That's the first study. The second study, second set of studies, <coughs> of which Malso only gave the key message, is on licensing. So here the idea is, if your goal is achieved, if you've done good, that gives you a license to eat with the risk of overconsumption. And we're particularly interested, would it matter when you're sort of indulging yourself, whether the products that you indulge from are labeled with the symbols, with the choices in this particular case? So does a health symbol justify self-licensing uh, or does it actually protect against it? So has the logo an impact? Now in this study we use buffet context. So we show consumers a huge assortment, a food buffet as you've seen here. We have 50% healthy, 50% unhealthy. And in some situations the buffet is labeled with choices logos on which are the healthier choices as sometimes we give people a license to indulge, and sometimes we don't. So this is an example. We have two types of studies, one in the Netherlands, which is an online hypothetical study. Here you see the assortment with the labels. Here you see the assortment without the health labels. And we've done a real-life replication of this study in Spain, where you see the actual food being presented with logo or without logo. And people, of course, could freely select from those buffets, and we would actually register what they eat. This is what it looks like. It's not really a restaurant setting, as you can see. Um, but the idea is that once they've completed the task, once they've uh, had the indulgence manipulation, they can take whatever they want. So what we see in these studies, first of all, is that indulgence had no effect on the amount of intake. So irrespective of whether you were put in a situation where you could be proud of yourself or where you, where you had achieved something really good, um, people still controlled their food intake to the same degree as when they were not put into that indulgence context. What we also see in the uh, hypothetical scenario, not as an interaction effect as we expected, but as a main effect, that if the assortment carries a label, carries a logo, people will actually eat less compared to when that logo is not present, and particularly so from the unhealthy foods. That's a nice finding, but actually was not the hypothesis we had in the study, because the hypothesis in the study said it would be an interaction. Um, also, in the Spanish situation, although you see a similar pattern, we could not replicate that main effect of logos. So it's a weak uh, effect, you could say. So conclusion, licensing does not necessarily affect total consumption, at least not in the studies that we report to you. Uh, Choices logo can reduce the consumption of healthy food, but irrespective <coughs> of this uh, licensing, and in real life, we could not strongly replicate those uh, findings. The third type of study is again in consumption, <coughs> again focusing on satiety claim, addresses the question, would it actually help if a satiety claim is supported by physiological evidence? <coughs> so if the product tells you this is a satiating product, and actually the number of calories that you ingest and the physiological response also tells you it's a satiating product, would that actually make people more responsive in terms of their consumption behavior? This is the study. So we have people in a two by two design. They were either given a 300 calorie breakfast or a 600 calorie breakfast consisting of breakfast cereals, uh, muesli breakfast. And half of those people received a satiety claim at the moment of the breakfast. So in half of them, it was supported by a claim. This muesli contains added fiber, Therefore, you will feel longer, uh, feel full longer for a long period of time. And then we ask subjects to come back for lunch, and we register the lunch. So we can see to what extent they compensated or they did not compensate for their breakfast, and to what extent that depended on the claim and on the uh, calorie intake. So we expected that the satiety claim would be more influential when consumers actually feel full, so had the 600 calorie breakfast. And of course, we're interested whether they noticed this in the first place, and it probably didn't have an effect. So this is the results. We see that having a high-calorie preload, a high-calorie breakfast, is something that individuals notice, right? So their self-reported appetite after breakfast reduced stronger when they had a bigger breakfast. We also see it carries on 
to the lunch, to the experimental lunch. So uh, low calorie makes you more hungry and more appetite. We also see that there is, it affects food intake at lunch, so people do compensate. But we see it does not depend on the health plan. So although we see those effects, we do not show evidence that claims actually have an additional effect or have an interaction effect over and above simply the caloric intake. Yeah, so here you can see that. So claim had hardly any effect, uh, even when the claim was noticed. So we've also asked people, have you paid attention to the claim? Have you seen the claim? Do you remember the claim? Even people who have seen the claim, for, even for those we don't see strong effects, the breakfast calories is really driving the process. So it seems that people have a capability of compensating at lunch for their breakfast calories, but unfortunately only partially so. So if they eat 300 calories more at breakfast, they eat 80 calories less at lunch. So that's a net effect of 240. So, um, and claims cannot prevent that. So that's consumption study. Now we move on to purchase studies. Yeah, so the purchase studies are conducted in the same teams. So Wageningen University, Corvinus University at Budapest, and the center at Aragon. And with the purchase study, I, I particularly want to emphasize the concept of visuals. So now we're looking more at packaging elements. How can visuals at the pack drive consumers' purchase behavior uh, and, and product choice? So the idea is that visual elements can help to attract attention. So just imagine your product there in this overloaded shelf and all those products want to cry to the consumer, take me, take me. Would it help if you actually support your product with a simple visual? because we assume that these visuals easily attract attention and they may actually guide attention also to the claims and, uh, and the products that they run. They might increase the attractiveness of the communication because it's easier, it's more intuitive. They may increase the understanding of the claimed benefit, yeah, and particularly if you have more complex worded or unfamiliar claims, then a simple visual can actually convey the message directly to you to increase product choice. Now, in many of those studies, I will already anticipate that we're going to look at targeted consumers, so consumers for whom the claim is relevant. You will explain afterwards why that is, but it actually builds on the Flabel studies already, where we see that to many consumers, health claims and nutritional information is not top of mind when they're in this crowded, busy supermarket. It's particularly working for consumers who have a health goal salient. Remember, that was the model that we worked from. So it's more the targeted than the average consumer, probably. So visual images. In this case, you see it's the Spanish study that we are uh, relating to now. We were asking if we have claims on calcium, as in this particular case, would it help if we support that claim with a visual? A visual that is either claim-specific, claim-related, so this is a bones uh, visual, that is overall health-related, so that it communicates to the consumer, well, this is a healthy option, and you can find the details here, as compared to a situation where the visual is unrelated to the claim. That's this uh, nice smiley. Yeah, so we have taste-related, overall health-related, and claim-related. And the question is, if we combine claims with either a specific, a general, or an unrelated visual, does that affect the choices that people make? Let's first look at attractiveness and communication. So here we have two studies, one in the Netherlands, the other one in Slovenia, um, where we manipulate the familiarity of the nutrient. So, um, or, or whether the, the nutrient naturally occurs. So in the Netherlands study, we manipulated familiarity by either using a well-known terminology like vitamin C, vitamin D, etc., or using a more technical term like retinol and I forgot the other one, cholefactol or something. So, so basically what you do is, is use ingredients that you can assume that respondents do not recognize. And we're interested whether the visual can actually support that. In Slovenia we did something similar but we manipulated slightly <coughs> different so we either took ingredients that naturally occur in the product, so calcium and milk, most consumers will know that, 
or we manipulated family, lower familiarity by using an, an enrichment claim. So for example, zinc in milk is something that will fit less well in the mental schemes that consumers bring to the, to the store. So, and we replicate that in different products to make sure that the, that the effects are not um, product specific. And as dependent measures, we look at consumers' expressions of how clear is what the product or the claim is communicating to us. Klaus mentioned that already. How attractiveness is this positioning of this product with that claim supported by that visual. And in the Dutch study, we also applied the cut method that Klaus talked about. So to see if consumers had to explain to other consumers what this product was actually communicating to them, would the inferences that they make, would they stay within the justified region or, uh, or not? The result, <clears throat> well, the strongest result we find is that if consumers can understand claims, if claims are simple, if claims relate to the mental schemes that, that Monique talked about, um, that increases clarity and that increases attractiveness of the communication. However, they can be supported by these visuals. So specific visuals, so particularly specific claims, claim-specific visuals, can actually help consumers to make them feel more, yeah, that, that, that a higher level of clarity with the claim and a higher level of attractiveness. We also show, and I think that's, that's even a more important finding, <coughs> that if consumers are familiar with the claims, and if, these are, uh, if consumers are familiar with the claim, they will more likely stay within that safe and risky, low risky environment of inferences that they make. So the minute the claims become more difficult, it's also more likely that they will make inferences which are not justified by the claim. Although that was not supported, that was not further supported by the visuals and the image. So that was about clarity and understanding of the communication. Of course, what we're particularly interested in, the class made that point, that, that claims can only have an effect commercially or in public health if consumers actually buy the products and consume the products. So the question was, if we have a claim and we support it with a visual, does that actually affect consumers' product choices? Does that affect purchase behaviors? Again, we have two studies, one in the Netherlands, one in Spain. And in this particular case, we were looking at ranges of products. So rather than individual products that might disappear in this huge support, uh, assortment, we now actually represented the situation where a brand can have a range of products with a stronger presence in that assortment. I'm going to explain that in a minute. Again, within those assortments, we have the images manipulated, the visuals. So in some conditions, there was no supporting visuals. In some conditions, we had the smiley, remember, the taste visual. In some, we had the overall health visual, the sporty person. And in some, we had a claim-specific visual, and that, of course, depends on the claim. Now, in these studies, we did one or two things as an extra manipulation. So part of the, the participants actually got their health goal activated. So we will say to people, you're going to buy a product and realize that in your family there is someone suffering from osteoporosis and blah, blah, blah. So the idea is that by giving that trigger, we activate the health goal, and that's the mindset with which people uh, make their purchases. In the Spanish situation, we did that in hindsight, so we asked consumers to choose, and then after their, their purchases, we asked them to what extent their health goal was salient, yeah, to what extent their health motivated, bone health motivated, etc. So this is what are we doing now? So we have three products here. This is the situation of the uh, breakfast cereals without an image. This is the situation where the calcium claim is supported by the claim-related visual. This is the situation where the calcium claim is supported by the overall image. And this is a situation where it's supported by taste-related. Now, these three products to participants will appear in a much broader assortment of 21 different products. So you just imagine yourself, you're being confronted with a shelf, 21 products, where these three are part of. And we say to consumer, make your choice. And of course, we check whether they choose any of these products. 
this is the result. And to help you a little bit, if it's 21 products and you make a random choice, then there is a con there is 15% chance that you, uh, sorry, um, 25, yes, 15% chance that you will buy one of those products. So what we see here is that if the health goal is not activated, you see that that claim virtually does not appeal to consumers. We have not tested this formally, but it seems to suggest that unless people enter a choice situation with the health goal active or salient, they will probably have other things on their mind when they make purchases, even in a laboratory situation, than to go for the osteoporosis or the, the bone health products. On the other hand, you see, that's the green bars, that if you activate that health goal, then people are very likely to also respond to that. Now, how you interpret that second part of the story, of course, is a bit tricky. Because you can say, we, these are just nice participants, they do what you, what you tell them to do. So it's a, it's a cognitive effect. But this is completely consistent with what we also found in the Flabel studies. Not to this degree, but the fact that health claims have an effect in situations where the health goal is active and that that effect is really limited when that health goal is not active. And I think we already talked about it this morning, so it's, it's always the two sides of the story. On the one hand, you need to activate the health motivation. On the other hand, you need to activate the inference-making process. And unless they fit together, it's probably not going to happen. So the health goal dominates the effect. If there is no relevant health goal, then the choice of products with a, with a health claim is actually uh, quite low. Health-related images, however, can help consumers to make those uh, healthful choices, but primarily so for people with an active health goal in, uh, in mind. Yeah, so we, we assume that if that health goal is active, that that directs people's attention and motivations. Yeah, so if your health goal is active, then you will search for a product that actually appeals to that health goal, and you would actually be more likely uh, to pay your attention there. So attention, <coughs> we assume, is an important factor. And we've tested that in the last study I think I'm going to discuss with you on eye tracking. So Klaus mentioned that already that eye tracking is a methodology in which we can actually follow the eye movements of people. We can actually monitor exactly when the eye fixates. And if the eye fixates for more than 300 milliseconds, we are pretty sure that that information is processed at a higher level. And if that eye stands still for 80 milliseconds, we count it as a, as a fixation. So that's what we basically did in this study. This study we conducted in Hungary. Um, same design as we had before. So again, we have products within an assortment. Um, but now in this case, people are sitting in front of an eye tracker. And we can actually see if they make those choices, whether the health goal directs them to a certain direction. So we're examining uh, attention as an underlying process. <clears throat> so we manipulated the health goal, we manipulated the type of visuals, and in this particular case, we also manipulated the health goal, where we said to consumers, assume you're shopping for an elderly consumer who has a health issue. Yeah? And we do that again in different product categories with different claims, to make sure that the products are not category or claim specific. Now, very surprisingly, what we find is that attention to health claims as compared to visuals in this sample or in this study actually led to people focus attention more often. So more people attended, a higher percentage of people attended to the claims than they did to the visuals. They attend to it faster, so it's closer to their first fixation. Um, it's sooner, so they're fixating first, and they fixate for a longer period of time. And again, even in the eye tracking study, we show that if you have a specific health goal, that actually guides your attention and that guides your conscious and unconscious search processes for products with a health claim. So in terms of general discussion, <coughs> the effect of claim and, uh, and symbols in their context of the packaging design, <clears throat> across this huge range of studies that we've done, I think at best we can say, or at fairest we can say, that these effects are subtle. That they're difficult to pinpoint, that their identification is depending on the methodology 
uh, that you use. That at least is my interpretation. Uh, attention may be a bottleneck. So if attention is there, if people are motivated, if the motivation is there, as, uh, as, as Wim said, uh, people will search for information, will use that information, um, but otherwise attention diverts easily to other things. The health goal salience drives the effect. So if people have a health goal in mind, they're likely to use claims and symbols, even search for it, but not uh, if that health goal is not. Visuals can support claims and logos. So I think that's the positive message that Monique, I think, was, was alluding to this, this morning. The fact that there are commercial elements or visuals on the packaging need not be a bad thing. It may distract people or it may mislead people, but it can also support a health claim. I think these studies show that if the visual and the claim are aligned, that can actually help in the interpretation. Familiar nutrients, or mental models that consumers have already developed from previous experience, can really help in health communication. So many of the claims, although I would say technically and, and, and nutritionally and physiologically they're absolutely correct, will not easily resonate with consumers, simply because they don't fit into that, into that mind model. So familiar nutrients, familiar processes, simple, relevant, as Monique said, uh, our studies show that that, that helps. Uh, the effects on food consumption are not fully consistent. So overall, I would not know what to say on do claims affect actual consumption um, at the dinner table. Mm -hmm.